Alone in a drowsy, syncopated tune, rocking back and forth to a mellow croon, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale, dull pallor of a one bulb light, he did a lazy sway. He did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues. With his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody. Oh, blues. Swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad, raggy tune like a musical fool. Sweet blues, coming from a black man's soul. Oh, blues. I started writing when I was little. I don't remember when exactly. I remember being five years old and writing in a notebook. So I've always written, and writing's always been a part of me. And I think that's why it's so, I feel such a connection to Langston Hughes, who was this black, queer writer who influenced people from James Baldwin to even me. chose this house because it's in the middle of Harlem, um, right off of like Fifth Avenue. Um, and so you, you'd be a, a, bit, a bit of a part of East Harlem and West Harlem. And then he, so he moved into this house uh, in 1947. He was able to buy the house with money that he had from um, poetry and plays that he'd written. Um, he would produce his plays a lot of the time in Cleveland and there was the, the first, I think, African-American theater in the U.S. in Cleveland. Um, and I think he actually made more money from plays than he did from poetry, even though he's known for writing poetry. Um, he lived in the house with his aunt and his uncle. He lived mainly on the third floor of the house. Um, so like, we know where the room was that people was his study. Um, yeah, and he lived here for 20 years and then he died of cancer. My, the executive director, Renee Watson, is a really good friend of mine. And I used to work with her, I used to be her assistant in her literary career, mm -hmm. right? So this was always a vision of hers. And when I was working for her in the summer of 2016, she wanted to pursue this vision of, of reaching out to the owner of the Langston Hughes house and asking if we could have a lease and just have it be an engaging space for the community creative arts nonprofit, right? So that's what we did. And the owner blessed us with a three-year lease and then she asked me to be, Renee asked me to be her program director for the nonprofit I Do Arts. I stood on the corner of loneliness and fear with overalls stained with dirt and a handful of sunflowers gripping them tightly as I waited for you to show. In my back pocket, a tattered note of anxious yet passionate words dripping with my Midwestern drawl. Are you ready to listen? Will you hear? Are you here? Hello, my name is Kennedy, and I too read Langston. I've been scarred and battered. My hope the wind done scattered. Snow has frizzed me, sun has baked me. Looks like between them, they done try to make me. Stop laughing, stop loving, stop listening. But I don't care, I'm still here. It's a collective of artists, right, and creatives who either volunteer or do creative conversations, have book readings here. But then also it extends itself even further because the community will have book readings, poetry readings, music events, conversations. Um, and that's what it's about, I think, is just uh, continuing on Mr. Hughes's legacy. He loved uh, music, he wrote short stories, he wrote poems, he wrote plays, he loved kids. Um, and so those are the, that's the type of things we like to see in our programming and put it out there for the community um, to not have to pay like an arm and a leg to come see some really great, rich talent. I've known rivers. I've known rivers, ancient, the water, older, and flowing, and blood from the veins. Rivers that flow through the was the embodiment of the Great Migration, as so many of these writers were, right? Having come from the Midwest and to New York City, and so he is part of that 
a huge moment of you know tens of thousands of people moving to New York, looking for opportunities, um, and then you know he was what you know quite frankly a lot of people were attracted to him like not only because of his again not only because of his intellect but also because he was the life of the party right so you have him be in relationships with these friendships with Zora Neale Hurston be with ever with everyone with, with Arturo Schomburg with you know W.E.B. Du Bois um with you know Elaine Locke so he's the center of it in that way it's it's an amazing thing to see people who maybe they're scribbling in their notebooks in their homes right and they feel like they're the only ones to have a place where they can gather and know that there are other folks like them where they can share and collectives such as i2 um, that really it provides safety and it provides feedback honest feedback um, and and just the assurance and the nurturance that as writers and as creatives people often need to create So when I found out that I2 was closing, it was kind of devastating for me, not really because of this project, just because this project introduced me to that place and to that space. And to have it taken away when it's only been around for three years is just, I really can come up with another word for it. I think about all the artists who've been nurtured in that short amount of time at this space. and. What Langston Hughes would have wanted, I think he would have wanted his house to be open to people. And I think that he would have wanted all these artists to come together. He would have wanted children to come together in this space. And it's just really horrible to see it be closed up. I honestly wonder if I would be where I am in terms of my art without the influence of Black artists like Langston Hughes. And I don't consciously think about it when I'm writing all the time, but I think that his, his spirit is there when I'm working and when I'm writing his spirit, James Baldwin's spirit, or in his spirit, I feel like they're there and they made these things that I want to achieve possible. And without them, without Langston, I wouldn't be here. My book wouldn't be on shelves. <laughs>